Father, thank you that this summer will be a summer of evangelism and of missions. Missions exist because worship doesn't. So Lord, we ask that you help us now as a church worship you in your word. Father, if there's any barriers or obstacles in this room now preventing us from worshiping you in your word, Holy Spirit, would you come and remove those strongholds? Cause us to be sensitive to your spirit and meet every need in this room this morning, Father. We pray this in your Lord's in, in your Lord Jesus' name, amen. It's a very exciting weekend to be in Montreal today and uh, all throughout the weekend because what's going on now? What are we missing out on right now? The Grand Prix. <laughs> we actually, Christians never had the opportunity to go on a Grand Prix because it always happens on Sundays. So the Grand Prix, every year millions of dollars are, are thrown into uh, Montreal Thousands of people flock into the city and then just to watch a few athletes, a few drivers go around concrete circles 70 times for 300 kilometers. And then yesterday I shared this with my wife and she said, for what? Such a waste of gas. Um, have you ever thought why these athletes, they dedicate their lives to training, they sacrifice their weekends, they sacrifice time with family, just to go around a circle 70 times? Have you ever wondered why they do that? And the answer is probably because they want to do it for, for the prize, for money or for glory. And it's not just Grand Prix that's like that. This summer we're going to see uh, Summer Olympics 2016 in Rio in Brazil. And if you've ever witnessed or if you've ever watched a documentary about Olympians, you can see just the amount of sacrifice these guys go through. I mean, they sacrifice their entire lives just to compete in a few minutes, maybe once or if they're lucky, twice in the Olympics, and that's it. That's it. I read an article this week on the sacrifices that athletes need to make. This was written by... Uh, Lance Armstrong, this is before he was uh, defamed, but he wrote three things that athletes need to give up. Number one is time. He said, being an athlete is an all-around-the-clock commitment. You have to give up a big chunk of your free time to spend t your time to spend friends with friends, your time with family, or your time with yourself. When you're not at the gym or not on the field, you're studying videos of your past performances. You're even looking at film footage of your competitors so you can learn their strengths and their weaknesses. So time. And then he says you have to give up your diets, your dietary choices. When you're in training and when you're an athlete, you have to follow a rigid diet plan set forth by your dietitian. You have to cons consume a precise amount of carbohydrates, con precise amount of protein and fats, and you have to give up the freedom of selecting your own food not only do you have to eat certain foods, but you have to eat it at specific times, often every few hours while you're awake. So he gives up food, he gives up time, and then he gives up sleep. He said, long gone are those days when you can press the snooze button on your alarm clock. Long gone are those days where you can sleep in. Being an athlete is a full-time job, so you need to start early, work late, and sometimes go without sleep. You don't take weekends or holidays off, and you stick to this rigid training so that you can win the prize. Why would anybody want to do this? And yet so many thousands of people in our society, we're crazy about sports. We're crazy about athleticism. Why do they do it? Why does an Olympian do this? And the answer is the same for the Grand Prix driver as it is for the Olympian. The reason for this is for the prize. Whether that prize be money, whether that prize be the gold medal, whether that prize be glory at the end, or whether that prize be a sense of accomplishment, or a, a sense of being, uh, being, living to the best of yourself, or simply being paid to do something that you love. Whatever the prize is, these athletes, they're willing to sacrifice everything for it. And in the article that I read um, about this, the, a journalist, he went and he asked 18 Hall of Famers, gold medal winners, world champions, or people who were all of these above, and he asked them, 
he asked them how they were ever able to give up all this just to win the prize. And you know what all these athletes, the overwhelming answer that they gave, they said, what sacrifice? Sacrifice? I'll do it again in a heartbeat. Overwhelmingly, the answer from these athletes was that the sacrifice they had to give, uh, the, the things that they had to give up were nothing compared to the prize that they gained at the end. And so having these two huge sports events in mind, the Grand Prix and the Summer Olympics, we turn now to the passage that we just read in 1 Corinthians 9. Because when Paul was writing this passage, he was thinking of the Olympics. He was thinking of these athletes who were giving up everything just to win a prize. And the amazing thing that he says here is that he too, as a Christian, he runs for the prize. So let's read again from 19 to 27. Chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 27. I'll read it and you can follow along. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 27. Paul says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law, but law of God, but the, but the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. But why does he do it? Verse 23. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that, I'm, uh, that I might share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it for, to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. If you have an ESV Bible and you look at the footnotes of verse 27, the literal translation is this. Paul says, I pummel my body and my, I make my body a slave, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And Paul gives two reasons here in these passages why he gives up his rights, why he gives up his love for, well, his, his, his right to eat food, why he gives up his right for respect, why he gives up his right to gain money from the church, what we saw last week. And he says in verse 23, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. And then in verse 27, he says, I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I should be disqualified. Why does Paul sacrifice for others? Why does Paul live out the ethic of love for others? And he gives two reasons. And these two reasons are actually the same. He says, I do it so that I might be sharing in the gospel, that I might be saved. That's what he's saying. To share in the blessings of the gospel is to be saved. And he says, to be, I give up my rights and I love my brothers and I sacrifice myself for them to win the prize. And what is the prize? The prize is, it seems here, to enter into heaven. But obviously Paul doesn't mean that you gain your salvation by your works, right? Because Paul is clear. He says clearly in the previous chapters that salvation is through Christ and his death and his resurrection alone. But what does he mean here? He means here that we have been saved by faith, but then our works prove that we are saved. He says that he is one who is saved by faith through Jesus Christ, but that his love for his brothers and that his sacrifice for his brothers proves that he is saved. 
But what I want to focus on today and what I want to point you today is for you to see that Christ and that Jesus and Paul, they do all of this living and all of this loving for the prize. Paul says, I do everything. I sacrifice everything to gain that imperishable wreath. It's so crucial for us to see that Paul is living for the reward. He says in verse 25 and verse 26, look, he says, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Paul says, I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating in the air. He's in it for the prize, right? He says, I'm not running aimlessly. He's not doing it for nothing. In the ancient world where Paul was, was living, the Olympic Games were mainly consisting of two sports. One was what, foot race and the other one was boxing. And for both of these events, the reward or the prize for the, win, the, the winner of these competitions was a wreath or a crown made of olive branches. But if, was that it? Imagine if that was it. All you got was a, was a wreath made of olive branches. Obviously not. With the wreath came glory. Some of these athletes, they had statues erected in their name. And throughout their hometown, they would become superstars. And just like today, where athletes are sponsored by mega corporations, back then, these athletes would return home and they would eat and drink and dress and live probably for free because people would sponsor them. So they would have fame, they would have glory, they would have money, they would have honor. It would be glorious. And Paul says here, he says, I'm in it for this kind of prize. I'm in it for the glory. And this might come off as a shock to many of us because when we think of love for someone, when we think of love, loving, loving love for our brothers and sisters, we think of love that, is, that has no regard for the self, right? To so many of us, for us, love means a selflessness. We think that love should be sacrifice that has no regard for the self. But Paul here is clearly saying something that is opposite to that. He's saying that he is loving his brothers and sisters and he is doing it for the prize. And the question we often have to, we have to ask and we have to answer here is, is Paul being selfish here? If Paul being self-interested in this passage, some people actually think that. Is the Christian life that he's advocating here a reward-driven and end-based Christianity where Christian love is the kind of love that loves others for a reward? And we see this kind of argument throughout our lives. We see it in our society. There was a sister that mentioned to me uh, a couple of weeks ago where one of her colleagues went up to her and said, you know, you Christians, you love people, but you do it to get into heaven. You love people because you do it to gain a reward. And therefore, your love is a, is a low ethic. But we, but me, I love people just for the sake of loving. And therefore, I am more righteous than you. Have you ever heard that? I've heard it before. And that's a good argument for a lot of people. People think that Christianity is a reward-based kind of religion where love is driven by reward. And it might seem this way, and a lot of people accuse Christians of this. And so we need to answer the question, is Christianity and is the Christian love that Paul is advocating here just a love that's motivated by a ticket to heaven? And we have a clue of whether this is true or not in verse 25. Okay, because Paul says in verse 25, every athlete exercises self-control in all things, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So the prize for Paul is an imperishable wreath. And another translation for this is an, is an imperishable crown. And so the crucial question we need to answer right now is what is this prize? Because if the prize is something that is outside of, uh, if, it, if, it is, if it's simply a prize that, that Paul is working for, then it may seem that he is doing it self-interested and he is living a selfish life. So Paul is seeking for an imperishable crown. The word behind the word wreath or crown is a word that we're all familiar with. 
It's the word Stephen or Stephanie. And this is a word that's been constantly on my mind recently because Alice and I have decided to name our first child Stephen or Stephanie, depending on the gender. And the word Stephen or Stephanie means crown. So what we need to do right now is we need to find out what crown means throughout the New Testament. We need to look for the Stephens and the Stephanies all over the New Testament. And I've, done, I've already done the work for you, and so I'll show you what this word means in the New Testament. There were three main me, re, me, uh, reason, there are three main meanings that Paul and the other authors of the New Testament use this word for. Number one, crown can be referring to the crown of righteousness. Listen to 2 Timothy 4.8. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which is the Lord, the righteous judge, which, who will, uh, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So the first use of crown is a crown of righteousness. The crown that all of us will wear when we stand before Jesus. Another use of crown is the crown of life. In James chapter 1 verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. The second use of the crown is to represent the crown of the eternal life, something that all of us will gain when we enter into heaven. But the third use of crown is the crown of glory. In 1 Peter 5.4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So the crown, this word crown or wreath can represent three different types of things. It can represent righteousness, can re represent life, eternal life, and can represent glory. But is this what Paul is after here? Is he after righteousness and life and glory? And the thing that's amazing is that when Paul uses the word crown, when Paul uses it with the word wreath, he uses it most often in a way that is completely different than what I just read to you. There is a fourth meaning of what crown represents, and this is what he means. In Philippians, 4, chapter, uh, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says this, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm, therefore, in the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 2, chapter 19, 20. Uh, ch chapter 2, verse 19 to 20. For what is our hope and my joy and our crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy. What is Paul referring to when he says crown? He doesn't just mean glory. He doesn't just mean righteousness. He doesn't just mean life. He means us, the church. When Paul speaks of the prize that he's running for, when Paul speaks of the reward that he's after, when he speaks of the crown that God is going to give to him, what is he speaking to us? What is he speaking of? He's speaking of the church. He's speaking of the believers. He's speaking of the brothers and sisters for whom he is living out the ethic of love. Do you see that for Paul, the prize is the church? The prize and the reward and the crown is the brother that he's preaching to? And the amazing thing is that that's Paul's reward. That's Paul's prize. But that's also our reward. That's also our prize. Our prize when we get to heaven is not only God being in front of us and being in our presence. It's not only seeing Jesus reigning over the universe. It's not only having the reward of eternal life. It's not only reigning with Jesus in glory over the new heavens and the new earth. Those are all rewards that we will gain. But Paul here is speaking of another reward that we seldom think of. And the reward is each other. Can you believe that? If you look to your left and you look to your right, that person who is sitting, sitting next to you as a Christian, he or she is your reward in heaven. 
That's what Paul is saying here. She will be your reward. He will be your reward. And as much as you love this person now, today in this life, you will love this person infinitely more in heaven because they will be without sin. As much as I love George, I will love him infinitely more in heaven because he will be without sin and without his mannerisms. As much as Alice loves me as, as her husband, she will love me infinitely more in heaven because I will be without all of my flaws, without my pride, and without my arrogance. And I will be her prize. That's what Paul is saying here. The prize and the reward for the Christian is Jesus, but it's also each other. That's an amazing thing to say. I can't wait to see Jesus in heaven. I can't wait to be in the presence of God when we get to heaven. But you know what? I can't wait to see you in heaven. Because as much as I love you as a church today, with all of your flaws and with all of our sins, in heaven we will be infinitely more beautiful and more lovely, and we will be each other's reward. We are each other's heavenly reward. And the implication of that is, is striking. It means that one of the main reasons why we evangelize is not so that we get to heaven or that they get to heaven. The main reason why we evangelize is because that person will be your prize in heaven. He will be your joy and your crown and your, and your eternal happiness in heaven. And so when Jesus says to lay up your treasure in heaven, he means to lay each of us up in heaven. When Jesus says, seek, not the king, uh, seek, not, uh, seek first the kingdom of heaven, he means to seek first each other in heaven. And what that means for a parent is that when you evangelize and you spread the gospel to your child whom you love so much in this life, you do it because you want that child to be with you in heaven eternally. When you spread the gospel to your unbelieving husband, you do it not just because it's your duty, you do it because he or she will be to you with you in heaven forevermore. And you will love him even more than you do now. And he won't even be your husband in heaven. That's amazing. We are each other's heavenly reward. And that's what Paul is saying here. That's his crown. That's his prize. That's his wreath. And do you see that Paul is not being selfish here? He's not. He's being loving. And we find in this passage a really unexpected definition of love here. And an unexpected definition of selfishness here. Selfishness is to seek our joy in other people. That's selfishness. When you use someone else to increase your joy, that's selfishness. But Paul here points to something that's completely different. He is seeking his joy in the joy of another person. And that's called love. That's the definition of love that is so unexpected here. To love is to seek your joy in the joy of another person. And that's not selfish. That's loving. That's what Paul is doing here. He's seeking his prize. He's seeking his reward. He's doing it all to gain a final reward in heaven. And what is the reward? The reward is his brother and his sister. That's the eternal happiness he will have in heaven. That's love. That's not selfishness. And we know this, right? When someone... When, when we say thank you to someone when they serve us and we thank someone for their service when, and someone replies to us, it's my pleasure. We don't say, what? It's your pleasure? How selfish of you to do things for your own pleasure. You're working for me for your pleasure? I mean, we would never say that. We would never say that. And we, won't, we wouldn't say that because that person's pleasure is rooted in our joy. That person's pleasure is rooted in our pleasure. And therefore, we would never say to them that they were a selfish person. Because that is not selfishness, that is love. When we seek our joy in the joy of another, we love that person. 
When we seek our joy in Jesus, we love Jesus. When we seek our joy in the joy of God, we love God. And we call that worship. That's the prize that Paul is after. It's God's people. That is his joy. And in the joy of his people, he finds his crown. And the amazing thing we need to realize is Paul, he does this not only because um, he's a pioneer. He says in chapter 11, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians, he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And the amazing thing we need to realize is that Jesus also had to run a race. He also had to compete in the race of life. He also ran for a prize. And he also won this prize. And he received a crown. I mentioned at the beginning that the word crown is used in four ways. It can represent the crown of righteousness, the crown of life, the crown of glory, and the crown of the church. But there's one other use of the, of the word crown that I haven't mentioned yet. And it's the crown of thorns. It's the crown that our Savior and our God, Jesus Christ, he traded in so that he would wear this crown of thorns on his head so that we would wear the crown of glory. It's the crown of thorns that the Lord forced on his forehead when he won the race. When Jesus came to the end of the race and he won it and he came in victory, the crown that the world gave him was the crown of shame. That the crown of glory that he had on his head, he laid down and in its place, the world placed on him the crown of death. And he wore this crown of death so that we would wear the crown of life. He, wear the, he wore the crown of sin on his head so that we would wear the crown of righteousness. That's the Savior we worship. That's the Savior who ran the race. And at the end of his race, the crown that he wore on his head was the crown of shame, of death, and of thorns. And he did all of this so that we would wear his crown, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life, the crown of glory, and above all, the crown of of the church. Don't you see, brothers and sisters, that Jesus, he ran the race, he won the race, and he gained the crown of thorns for us. Just as Paul ran the race for the prize of the church, Jesus Christ, he ran the race to win the church. Do you see that Paul here in all of 1 Corinthians, he's been going through the same theme again and again telling the church just how precious you are to Jesus. He ran the race so that he would win you as his prize. He paid for the price of your bridal cost so that you can be purchased as his bride. In, in Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, this is what the apostle writes. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a, crowd, a great cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. By faith, Jesus ran the race. By faith, he ran it for the purpose of winning the joy and winning the prize that was set before him. But what was this joy? What was this joy that was in heaven that was so attractive to him that he was willing to lay his life down and die a brutal death on the cross? What was this joy? Is it simply the joy of being reunited with his father? Is it simply the joy of being seated at the right hand of God and being the king of the universe? Is it the joy of being able to reign over all the earth? I think it is. But you know, the thing is, he had all of those things even before creation. <laughs> he had all of these things even before incarnation. 
So there must be something that was, thi- that, that was in heaven, this side of incarnation, this, I, this side of the resurrection, that was so attractive to Jesus that he was inj- able to endure the cross and despise the shame of the cross. What was this joy for Jesus? And the thing is, the joy that was set before Jesus, just as for Paul, is the church. It's us. We are the joy for which Christ laid his life down for. We are the joy for which Christ enjoyed the cross. You are his joy. You are his prize. You are the one for which he ran the race. You are the one for which he died on the cross for. And he won you. And he won us. And he did it by exchanging his crown of glory. And he took the crown of thorn that was supposed to be on your head, the crown of death that was supposed to be on your head, and he took it and he wore it in your place. Amazing grace. How can it be that you, my king, would die for me? Let's pray. And if there's anyone here today who hasn't yet given their life to Christ, and I mean really given their life to Christ, if there's anyone here today who hasn't yet surrendered his life to Christ, just know this, you are his prize, you are his joy. You are his crown. And today is the day of salvation. Give your life to Jesus today. And I mean really give your life to Jesus. Really surrender the throne of your heart to him. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you because in your word we see such an amazing truth that not only are we each other's reward in heaven, but we are the reward for which Christ died. There is nothing more beautiful than to know that we are your son's joy. And for those of us sitting here today who have given our lives over to you Father, show us what an amazing inheritance we have in Jesus Christ. Revive our hearts. Show us what joy is before us so that we would run this race, living the life of sacrifice, living this life of love, and doing it willingly and saying at the end, we would have done it all over again in a heartbeat. In Jesus' most precious name we pray, amen.